Hello and welcome to another episode of the Don't Give a Rip podcast. I uh, got pulled over by the police for speeding. Oh my God. <laughs> Andy, for some reason, decides he wants to flip the car. So he's there <laughs> flipping this little Fiat. And he went, Fancy. He said, you need to retire. Now I look back on that, on that time, wow, it was just, it was pretty remarkable journey to life. The All Blacks are expected to win, and not only expected to win, but to do it with panache. By the time I got offered a contract, I'd already signed for France. We found him unconscious in someone else's tent. Right. Well, first of all, Josh, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Uh, and secondly, congratulations on yet another outstanding performance for yourself last time out against your former club, the Scarlets. Um, do you believe you're playing some of the best rugby of your career so far? Uh, yeah, I probably am, actually. Uh, mm. You know, I go back to... 2016 is another season that stood out for me, but this year, you know, I've 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 really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I've you know, I, I think it helps that I've been playing week in, week out, um, a bit of consistency in, in performance as well. Then and you know, I I'm actually enjoying my rugby more than ever. I know um you know, I'm 33 now, but I feel like a 28 year old and I keep saying I've been 20 28 for the last five years. So and I think when you hang around with the or you're involved in a group of players in the blues and they're a lot younger than you are, um, you know, it, it makes you feel younger and you know, you want to try and keep up with them or I try and make them keep up with me because I'm <laughs> still in a better position than them. But you know, it's uh, you know, I'm enjoying it more than ever, and that's I think that's the key really, and I'm gonna work with a smile on my face. Yeah. How does that transition come across? I've always been interested in how rugby players, because, you know, it only seems like yesterday you were breaking through. It's just weird how quickly your rugby career comes and goes. Um, and you've still got plenty of years still ahead of you. But where does that transition come from where you're sort of the young, the young cub in the pack to one of the leaders? Because you are one of the leaders now with the, the Cardiff Blues. Yeah, you know, it's, I can go back in 2007 was when I made my first game, played my first game for the Scarlets. Hmm. And then I left seven years after that in 2014. And, you know, by that point, I was probably, um, you know, there was a period of transition in the Scarlets where a lot of senior players left. And then, you know, there's relying on younger players coming through. And there was a group of us, uh, I'd say, like um, McCusker, Ken, Priestland, South, John Davis, that all come through the system together. And, you know, the next thing before you know it, you're, you're the senior players in the group. And um, I think when I went to the Blues, you know, I was kind of in... in in that middle period, I was like 25 ish, 26, you know, and, um, you know, I was probably seen straight away as, as a senior player then, because there was a lot of youngsters coming through. So now the Blues had a lot of senior players then as well, um, you know, in Gethin and Matthew Reese, um, And then, you know, you had people like Sam Ogden still playing and Josh Navidi was there. And then you had all these youngsters come through with like Ellis and um, Jared and Thomas and Owen Lane. So, you know the conveyor belt just keeps on coming. I guess as you as you get older, um, you tend to have a little bit more responsibility. You've got a little bit um, more um, understanding of how the game is played and how the environment works. Um, and yeah, it just it's just it's just a natural thing, I think. And you know it's crazy how many years you've been with the Blues now. I've always remembered you as a as a Scarlet's play. They're born and bred, but um, you know you've been at Blues for quite a few years now, haven't you? I think I've this year I've is the year where I've uh yeah, I've been in the blues longer than I've been in the Scarlet. In terms That's of crazy the environment. So um yeah, you know, it's uh it's time flies when you're having fun, they say. <laughs> yeah, but on that on that game with the Scarlets, it must always be nice to to vi- revisit the, the park of Scarlets and it is always that a little bit sweeter when you get a victory there as well. I reckon I've probably got a better record since I've been in the Blues over the Scarlet. I have the Scarlet over the Blues. But I don't know. It's, uh, or, <laughs> no, it's, um, you know, it's all... Do it's whether that's good or bad. Uh, it's, well, it's the one game, I probably, or the, the games you look out for when the season fixture list comes up. Mm. You're like, oh, look, mm-hmm. where, where are they? When are we playing them? Um, yeah. And it's kind of like, I kind of just raise, raise intensity levels a little bit. And, you know, I'm probably such an eager... You could be in that week to get out on the field and get just get to the end of the week so I get to get a yeah. week into the boys. Like yeah. I say that there's, there's not many boys in the Scarlets now who are 
who were there when I was still there. There's probably, yeah. you know, um, there's a handful of boys who I probably coached when I was coaching Scarlet's 18s who were involved in the environment now. But I'd say there's only Ken, uh, Shingler, John Davis, mm. yeah, um, oh, Gareth Davis has come off, you know, and then you look beyond that, you've got like Steph Hughes, Steph Evs, Kieran Hardy, Javon Sebastian, all those boys I coached when they were in Scarlet's yeah. 18s. But they've, <laughs> they've, done, they've trans- transitioned through. So, mm. you know, it, um, obviously, it, you're aware of who's down there and stuff, and you know it's always nice to put a big performance in against your old club. Yeah, it's amazing the sort of turnover of clubs these days, isn't it? Because I think the I think Scarlets get rid of twelve players. I think uh, they're out of contract or or something like that. It's amazing how that sort of turns out when players aren't always at that club for so many years. Uh, but on that Scarlets game, um, one player that stood out apart from yourself uh, was Jared Evans. I, I played with Jared from the age of thirteen. I played against him you know, uh, from under eight all the way up to youth. Uh, and I knew what talent he had from a very early age. He'd, he'd have this sidestep and this dummy where you know he's going to dummy, but he still managed to get past you. And he's, yeah. and I just wish, because I remember at the age of 14, being in my local rugby club with my old man, and we were talking about putting a bet on Jared becoming a British Lion one day. And we were talking about how all the odds would be. Obviously, they'd be very, really short now, but... How impressed have you been with Jared lately? Because there was a lot of talk of him going to uh, an English club in, in the Premiership to maybe try and get further in his, his Welsh career. But how how many leaps and bounds has he come on over the last few years? Oh, massive. You know, uh, he's he's really stepped up uh, with his leadership role in the last couple of seasons. Mm. You know, and um, I think, you know, when you've got, you've, you've got a player like that, you've got to utilise him to the the best of his ability really and you know mm. the way he, sh- sh- he sent Ken for a hot dog the other week against the Scarlets oh. you know and you know uh, I, but the thing is Jared's been doing that for the last especially yeah. all of this season anyway and um, you know I think he's busting to just try and do that on the international stage now and mm. um, I don't think it'll be too long before he's getting that opportunity um, because his form his form uh, warrants it um, and you know he's a he's a real good kid, and you know I think he's got a real good partnership with it, whether he's playing with Lloyd or whether he's playing with Thomas um, mm. Williams at nine. You know they've got a really good understanding, and um, mm. you know how how they want to play the game and and pushing our us as a pack of forwards forward um, and playing playing in the right areas of the field because we can all not we all know how dangerous he is when he's got ball in hand. Yeah, and it's crazy when. Obviously, there was a lot of talk of him going uh, to one of the Gallagher Premiership clubs, and you sort of see the the, the sort of players that they have there at a fly off the young players like Umaga, uh, Marcus Smith, you know. And I still, and, and without sounding biased, I still think Jared, you know, can play them off the park on on any given day because he's that talented. Um, on the management of the Cardiff Blues, Di Young has has come in, and now he's been given. The full-time role. Um, I'm not sure if you've worked with him before, but how have you found the new setup uh, of management at the Arms Park? Um, yeah, no, I haven't worked with Dai before, um, but Dai actually did try and sign me while I was while I had a couple of years left at the Scarlets, and then obviously Phil Davis went there, and he he did sign me then. So <laughs> yeah, um, no, I think Dai's been pretty. He's been good since he's come in. You know, he's been straight down the line. Um, you know, he's told the boys what he wants, and you know. Mm. I think we'll only see that more die over a period of time now when he when he um obviously settles in now and we move forward into next season. I think we'll start mm. to see a, a die young imprint come out in the Cardiff Blues then. Mm. And over the last few weeks, you know, you, you've been skippering the blues and for the first time in rugby history, that there's new laws, that there's the the captain's challenge, you've, you've got the the goal line dropout. And I, I, I tuned into the the Blues Dragons game where you were hit off the ball, or or, or you you were hit in the, in the head with a, with a shoulder, and you got the the guy sent off realistically, which was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it because there was so many different angles, and the referee had to go all the way to the end of the pitch. And what what was going through your head at that point? Um, oh well, I just remember we'd gone through a few phases and we hadn't gone anywhere. And then I remember, you know, um, Teddy Williams had the ball, and I latched onto him, and <laughs> as we made as we made. Uh, he made contact. I got absolutely smoked, and I was yeah. like, "Oh, that was right on the <laughs> on the button. That was right on the sweet." <laughs> and then, you know, I wasn't I wasn't concussed or anything, and I knew what was going on. It took me a couple of steps to get my breath back, and uh, mm. eventually, I think two phases later, we scored. Yeah. But I went to the ref. I said, "Ref, I think I've just been, uh, you know, I, I've been shoulder charged in the head." And he's going, oh, "Are you going to call a captain's challenge?" And I went, "Yeah." <laughs> 
<laughs> Throw <laughs> down. <laughs> they, they, they called one in the Dragons had called one in the first half, which mm. was, you know, it was quite laughable at the time because yeah. uh, when he watched it back, it was it was nothing. Team Bash would run into Corey Hill and you know, uh, when Ross called it, he said, Oh, it's a shoulder charge there. And it was like he just bounced <laughs> off. And was <laughs> Only he could see come up with something like that, couldn't he? And then, and yeah. then obviously I called mine and they went, All I heard was you, you fucking snake like that, <laughs> you snitch. <laughs> and then initially the ref went to the other side of the field and uh, he's watching the big screen and they're showing this the wrong clip. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It's not, it's not that. And they're like, the boys are going, KT, if that's the clip, you are. <laughs> <laughs> they're called all the Lings on the Sun. I was like, no, 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 it's not that. It's like four phases later. Yeah, it was like obviously clear, clear and obvious that you know, um, Reese Lawrence had flown in with the shoulder and yeah. was a little bit reckless, and it caught me, caught me sweet. Um, and uh, the ref saw it. He's like, oh, you know, there's a red card. Mm. Um, but from my point of view, it shouldn't be down to the captain to go calling a challenge like yeah. that. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd rather not see the captain's challenge in, in there. What yeah. I would rather see is the TMOs are a bit more switched on and they pick yeah. up pick up those sort of things. Mm. And the only time they pick up things like that is if the player's down injured. And if the player goes down injured, then he's off anyway. Yeah. So um, it, it, you'd up you for concussion um, symptom check. It was sensational because if you watched in full time, like as you said, there was a few wrong clips that they were trying to use, trying to look at something else. And I was like, well, that, that's nothing. And then they sort of played it through full time. And you almost could miss it. You really could miss it if it wasn't yeah. on you. You would have probably missed it. Do, do, do you get what I mean? And it's it's crazy I mean, how, you know, it's sort of brought to light how many physical challenges like that to the head you're going to get in a rugby game that are going to go unmissed, even with all the cameras. I know, and, and that's the thing. They were, they're trying to eradicate out of the game. But mm. how are you to bring it to their attention unless you use a a captain's challenge for it and like you know I'd, I don't know if any of the, if I'd have seen it or any of the other boys would have come to me and said oh look I've just been smoked off the ball and by someone's shoulder to the head yeah. and said you need to call the captain's challenge on that the thing is we'd scored anyway so you know yeah. I don't know if 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 it had been on anyone else if it would have happened or not so yeah, um, you know it's just one of those things like they picked up on Owen Lane's tackle off the ball after mm. the nine had flung it back inside and the TMO stepped in there. Mm -hmm. So, but like, I don't, with the game, the way it's played and how fast things are happening, I don't know if they would have picked up on it. So, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's weird, you know. Like, I didn't want to intentionally get someone sent off, but I was just yeah. going to the, temp the referee, if that makes sense. Brilliant. They call me a snitch. So that's brilliant. Um, but but it's, it's, it's weird, you know, like, I've loved rugby all my life. This is why I'm doing this, this sort of thing. You know, I've been a referee as well myself. Um, but it's got to the point over the last year, I've interviewed people from all over the world and it's the same message. People are just getting sick of not so much the law changes as well, but, but the way rugby's going at the minute, you know, every single little thing is being checked. And, you know, even you look at Wynn Jones in the, in the Six Nations against Scotland where, you know, Xander Fagerson comes in and, and hits him off the ball in a ruck. You know, five years ago, that wouldn't have even been a yellow card, would it? Do you know what I mean? No, so, so what's it like from a, from a player's and the captain's point of view? I think the biggest thing is they want to, they want to eradicate that like recklessness out of the mm. game because that's what causes injuries. And um, you know, I like to think that I've always been a hard, fair player, uh, mm. and that's I, that's the way I've always seen the game being played. Um, you know, there's always a chance for a free shot in the ribs or something, but that's within mm. a tackle or a maul or something like that. Um, but I think it's that it's that kind of reckless charging into a ruck. Mm. Guy's unprotected. He can't protect himself because he's in a vulnerable position mm. and then gets clonked on the head. So, um, and I think nowadays with the TMOs and stuff, they can slow things right down and it actually makes it look worse than what it yeah. is sometimes because it's happening much faster than that. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's... You know, it's, it's one of those things I think, you know, players got to be a little bit more cautious now there's mm. still ways of cleaning some out of a ruck without smashing in the head, basically. Yeah. You just have to be it, a bit more technical about things rather than mm. uh, reckless, basically. Yeah. It is, it's mad how maybe, you know, the, the law changes down, I'd probably say, the last 20 years uh, have changed and they, they're creating different injuries for players. So, for example, the, the ruck area, 
I, I'm not sure if you were around when you were able to ruck and and stamp on the player and try and get him out, try and get him out of the ruck. But in some ways, that was actually. Um, I'm not, I'm not the, <laughs> I was gonna say um, it, it was it'd be less painful than you know somebody having to try and get you out of the ruck physically and maybe somebody cracking a a, a bone yeah. in their foot or a bone in their leg by you know Sam Walton think, is up to Sam Walton so many times, hasn't it? I think you know now you just get penalized for lying on the wrong side. Yeah. Back in the day, you could lie on the wrong side and, and slow the ball up and take a shoe in. And yeah. you're like, oh what a hero, that guy's just lay there, slow the ball up, but he's mm. taken Three, four yeah. stamps on the Two grazes, yeah. Two grazes, and they just got on with it. But, you know, um, you know, the, you are still allowed to ruck, mm. but you've got to make it look like a, like the foot movement is coming backwards rather mm. than up and down. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, a, you know, usually if you if there's a defender like there, he's going to get penalised anyway if you're not rolling away. So, yeah. you know, they're trying to speed up the game. And, uh, you know, You've got to find other ways of slowing the ball up, basically. Mm, yeah. It's, but, it, it, it's amazing we could talk about this all day. Can we, it's becoming quite political now, and everybody's <laughs> trying to have this say. Uh, but let's bring it back to you now, Josh. You, you just said, you know, about your age. You're only 33. You turned 33 in March, I believe. Um, but it certainly seems like you've got a lot of years still ahead of yourself. Um, during the, the first lockdown, what was your the mindset of, you know, oh, oh shit, you know, I might be losing another year of my career here, you know, I've still got so much to play for. Or was it nice to, you know, press that reset button and, and start again? Um, first few weeks, I trained like a lunatic because I thought we were, it was like, we were yeah. going to be off, like initially, <laughs> we stayed off three, four weeks and we're trying to get back things. Things going again. Uh, ended up being five months. So, yeah. um, you know, the first uh, few weeks, I was running. 5Ks and, and, you know, I was keeping myself in, in good nick, uh, training quite hard in the gym. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, we were told it was going to be longer. So I kind of eased off a little bit and uh, spent spent plenty of time with the kids and built them a, a, a tree house out in the garden and, mm. you know, just did things around the house. Because literally just before lockdown, we moved into a new house. So, you know, I just got to grips with that really. And then mm. all of a sudden I was thinking, you know, I can use this time as a, refresh the batteries and and mm. probably that's probably why I've done right this season in terms of performances because I felt refreshed and um you know I don't think if you speak to any rugby player um the longest they would have had off is probably five weeks six mm. weeks max in, a, in an off season we haven't had a break like that you know even if you're injured you're still you'd still be training um doing something you'd be rehabbing so you you can't mm. switch off mentally I think the best thing about that break was everyone was able to switch off mentally and physically for a good couple of months. And then, you know, I think there's been a massive difference in terms of the way the speed the game's been played since I've come back anyway. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it just shows how much, how much um, uh, of a benefit of having a longer break can be some, sometimes into some players. Mm. Well, well, let's take yeah. a trip down I, memory. I've had, I've, had a, I've had a couple of years on anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, well, let's take a trip down memory lane, down to your younger, your younger years. Um, back in 2008, I think that was the first time that I actually watched you live. It was the, the France game uh, in the World Cup, the, the Junior World Cup of that year. And, and luckily, we, we just about managed to win in, in the, I think it was the 86th minute or, or something yeah. like that. It, it was a real buzz around Wales at that time because the World Cup was being held in Wales and, and we ma- did manage to get out of the group. Um, I'm assuming you remember that match quite well. <laughs> Or do you not? Yeah, well, fair, <laughs> I remember. I remember. You know, I went. I was quite lucky enough. I went to three Junior World Cups. I went mm. the one in two thousand six in Dubai. Two thousand seven. I went in two thousand six as a youngster, a year young. Mm. Two thousand seven is my own year, and then they changed it then to the following year, two thousand eight to twenties. And yeah. the first year and the third year were brilliant. You know, we had some really good players in both. Mm. A lot of those players in both those age groups went on to become pro rugby players, and mm. you know that that. 20s year then was was phenomenal you know I remember I quite remember most of the games I played in those age group games as well so you know I remember that I remember that tournament well uh, and do you remember the aftermath of it <laughs> yeah we <laughs> jerk started it <laughs> I'll chuck him on. in the bus I, I know I've seen, I've seen I've seen that what, what did he do um oh we scored the, the conversion had been taken I think and then the boys were like still celebrating and then uh French Webby's just started smiling and tapping this French French boy in the face. I was like, unlucky. And then the next thing, this bloke just started 
ragging him about. <laughs> um, Patrick Palmer used to play for Pont yeah. Yeah, like, Took a sweep to the head. This French French boy had been subbed off. Him flying in, head butted him. And he was trying to break it up. And it was just ructions everywhere. Everywhere I looked, there was someone having a scrap. And yeah. the worst thing was, we were staying in the same hotel as him. The Marriott and Swansea. <laughs> so, uh, like, all I remember is I'd gone to help a couple of boys. And I was pulling this Frenchie off him. And all I seen was my mum coming down the stand. Oi, get away from there now. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and then eventually the French boys got escorted off the field and we stayed outside for oh no we went inside first and we took our time in the change rooms at a at a, um, a sit down and they kept us in the Liberty then for a couple of hours and then they mm. sent the French boys off to the hotel and uh, we went back to the hotel a couple of hours later and they were all sitting in the foyer waiting for us <laughs> <laughs> and then they with said, bars yeah, they said a team meeting downstairs in, in 15 minutes come down in your civvies whatever and uh, Jimmy Norris, winger, you know, he was, he was, he was ginger and pale at the best of times. And he came <laughs> down the lift. He was even whiter than white because he'd been in the lift with <laughs> Matthew Bastereau. So and, uh, he got in the lift and then he was on the way down and Bastereau got in the lift and he was like that. Uh, he just like, he said he wanted the, the floor to swallow him up. Yeah. And he like came trembling out the lift. And they sent us home for the night. They said, look, go home, um, relax with your families and then we'll catch up tomorrow. And, uh, to be fair, we went, we went back the next day. The French boys were all right, shook our hands. And on the last night, we all had a beer together in the team room. So, um, you know... That's it, rugby, what, isn't it? What, what, and that was, that was rugby, yeah, so... <laughs> well, well, if you look at that Welsh side, it was unbelievable. You know, the likes of Halfpenny, Jonathan Davis, uh, Dan Bigger, I, I think, might have played in that game. I'm not sure. Was, uh, um, Rhys Webb. Rhys Webb, Dan Bigger, Jason Turvey, Dan Evs, the Halfpenny, John Fox... I can't remember who the other centre was. Sam Warburton. Uh, Sam Warburton, uh, myself and Dan Franks in, sec- in the back row. I think it was Hayden Pugh and Jeremy Groves in the second row. Yeah. I couldn't tell you who the front row was. Well, that's quite, it's <laughs> quite unbelievable, though, to be part of that set. Sam Hobbs, possibly. Yeah. Another so, Ponty prop. Yeah. So, like, you know, a lot of those players, um, over two thirds of them, have gone on to become Welsh internationals. Hmm. Yeah, is, is, is a, uh, what I was going to say to you is, you know, looking back at the Welsh under 20 team, there's amazing players in there. And 13 years later, do, do you feel your career path went the way you wanted it to? Because, you know, obviously you're, you're seeing the likes of Dan Bigger, Reese Webb, uh, and, and the likes of Jonathan Davis go on to play for the Lions. Do, do you think you had the ability to, to follow that career path? What, play for the Lions? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> um, no, I'm only, like I'm only asking coaching. because, you know, You've been the bedrock of, of many sides, you know, the Scarlets, you were the bedrock of their back row or in the second row where you played. You know, whenever you've played for Wales, you've never let us down. So, you know, um, you did have the ability. I think, uh, uh, I th- the difficult thing was, when I started to break into the Wales team, there was, uh, you got to, like, think of the, the boys who were in around, in around that um, mm. environment then. So you had Martin Williams, Ryan Jones, Jonathan Thomas, Andy Powell, um, mm. And then you obviously, so there's three out of four Lions there. Mm. Um, and then you go in, Sam Obden, Toby Fartow, Dan Idiot, Justin Tipperick. There's another mm. four Lions. So you're thinking, it's set, like when I first had a break in, that was the back row and mm. three out of the four of them were Lions. You know, a couple of years later when they retired or finished, there's another crop of boys come through and most of them ended up being Lions. So the mm. competition for that back row of the scrum was was phenomenal. Um, mm. You know, it's you know, I wouldn't say I, I back my ability all day long, but I think you've got to be able to uh, maintain that, which you know, uh, to a regional standard I have done. But maybe mm. I just haven't had that opportunity because of the quality uh, international level, basically. Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, it's been quite yeah. respected by the boys because they're they're really the quality players, mm. and they're all in their own right, and they're you know they deserved everything they've 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 gone on to achieve. Yeah. Having done some research on your career, look, it looked like 2011 was going to be your real breakthrough year, wasn't it? Uh, you know, you had a really good season with the Scarlets and then I think you were picked for the, the training camp for the, for the World Cup, having made your, your debut against Scotland in the previous Six Nations. Yeah, that, you know, um, I think the end of 2010, there was, there was, I was probably, you know, I was close in 2010, November. Mm. Um, you know, I was talked about around then, you know, I, I kind of took my form through then through Christmas period. And the year before I'd actually been 
it was a year before that. I can't remember. I'd had a five week ban, which completely kind of ruled me out, and I was you know in some decent form then. Mm. The following year, then it just I just kind of kicked on. You know, I was I was working uh, with David Lyons on the Scarlets. Mm. Um, you know, a guy who had um, plenty of time for the youngsters, and that's one of the, the biggest things I could say is how much I learned off him and when he was like 32 and how much time he was given to the younger players and mm. um, you know, I learned a lot it was invalu- his time was invaluable basically so and then that 2011 year just kind of kicked on then obviously got picked in that um, Six Nations squad made my debut um, and then had a pretty good season that year and um, mm. you know just missed out on uh, on, this, on the World Cup um, you know uh, toss for a coin I think uh, Gat said so yeah it's crazy because, you know, I think from looking at the squad, it looked like you lost out to, to maybe Ryan Jones because I think Ryan Jones at that point was, you know, helping out in the lock and in the back row he could play five, six or eight. And that was sort of similar to yourself, wasn't it? Do you, do you think maybe being that utility player has maybe gone against you or has it helped you? Um, yeah, well, it's probably one of the reasons I left the Scarlets really was because at the time I was playing, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, in a first choice in a position. Hmm. In the words I were told, I was told I was a first choice back, uh, first choice back rower. So yeah. you know, it just depended on the makeup of the back rower. If there was one of the boys wasn't playing, then I'd slip into that role because you know I had the versatility to do it. You know, I also chuck my chuck my chuck myself into the second row a couple of times on the Scarlets. And then when I when I decided to move the Blues, the conversation I had with the then coach was, you know, we're looking for a six who can play eight. Mm-hmm. It would be ideal in this in this environment, and you know, it pricked my conscience a little bit. My ears lit up, my eyes lit up, and my ears perked up. And I was like, "Oh, let's go and give it a bash." And to mm-hmm. be fair, at the end of that season, I played at the Scarlets. I ended up going on tour to South Africa in, yeah. uh, in twenty fourteen, and then the following year, I did, well, I didn't play for the, I didn't get involved with Wales then for another two years. So yeah. you know, it, even though my form was was pretty decent, so you know, it's just one of those things. I think it's the uh, you know. Selection is a matter of opinion, and obviously, at the time I wasn't wasn't flavor of the month. Yeah, and I, I might be wrong, but I think in 2011, I'm not sure if you were you were part of the training squad prior to the World Cup, uh, but that might have been the first time I think Wales went to Poland prior to a a big tournament. Um, you were you, and how, how was that? How was that training and, and the cryotherapy chambers? Um, brutal, you know. Yeah. It's the the um, toughest camp, 25 days of camp I've ever done. Mm. Um, you know, it was it was it was relentless. It was double, triple weight sessions, cryo yeah. four times a day. You run in rugby skills. Um, you know, but I think it, it um, the amount of work the boys put in uh, put them in a good place because of how well they did in the World Cup then yeah. and later on that, that year. So. You know, it, it was a really good environment to be around at the time, and you know, I, 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 I gotta say, I loved it, and you know, I'm, I'm a big trainer. I love, I love training. Um, yeah. I love, I pride myself on my, uh, on my fitness. Of course, it's my X factor, and um, you know, uh, I, I really enjoyed that camp. You know, and mm. you know, I, I think you know, I took so much away from it. Then, I remember, mm. I remember when they told me that I wasn't going to be in, involved in the World Cup, and then. I was on the standby list, and four weeks later, I ended up having surgery on my shoulder. So, oh, shit. Um, missed out on that one. But yeah. you know, it, just some of the experiences you take away from those camps is is massive. Mm. Was it survival of the fittest though? And was there any tempers flared? Oh, there's always there's always uh, you know a bit of pushing and shoving because you know everyone's trying to make a mark, mm. aren't they? Basically, uh, especially in the mauling sessions and the contact stuff. Mm. But you know. I think everyone knows uh, everyone's going to put it in when it comes down to the fitness fitness side of things. You know, you're not going to be mm. you're going to be you're going to be found out if you if you um, if you're not going to put the effort in, basically. Yeah, and and if you look at the caps that you've you've had, you know, ten caps are in double figures, so, so that's that's one good thing. Um, <laughs> it's but, but, I ever of anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and you know, I'll die just for one minute on that field for Wales, mate. Um, but you know, you put some massive shifts on on the tours of. South Africa in 14 and again in Argentina in 2018. Um, let's firstly talk about the South African tour um, and how close we came to nicking that, that second test. Um, unfortunately, Liam Williams, you know, put in a high tackle in the corner. I was had my head in my hands and I was absolutely gutted for Sanjay. 
Um, but despite the loss on a personal level, you know, you must have been chuffed with the, your own uh, performances out in South Africa, you know, playing playing number seven. Yeah, I'd, um, it was, well, obviously, uh, the back, back row makeup was, you know, I kind of had a inkling after that first game against the, the, um, who do we play? The Kings. Mm. That I probably wasn't going to be involved in the test. And that, um, you know, I, I just played seven, went about my business, and had a pretty good game. And, you mm. know, I ended up being on the bench for that first, first, uh, first test then. And I just remember in the conversation from, uh, not well, in one of the meetings, Sean Edwards was like, if they run a five man play, they're coming back with a flash with Willie LaRue. And Willie yeah. LaRue like rounded two of our boys, scored two tries in the first test. Yeah. So like I think the clock has literally gone like maybe 50 minutes gone. Um I just remember well, maybe less than that. And I was I was running on. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, anything in green, I'm absolutely gonna whack it today. <laughs> and I made something like 15 tackles in about 25 minutes. And yeah, uh, the following weekend. You know, I was rewarded with a start against mm. uh, against in the second test. You know, and my form throughout that, that last season, I was at the Scarlets, had been pretty good. So, you know, and I had that build to play six, seven, or eight. So, you know, I just went out there and and, and I remember Sean saying to me, "If Dwayne Vermeulen runs you, just fucking whack him." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, fine. And you know, literally, that's you know, I, the game went so quick, and then. I was actually man of the match in that game, and yeah. uh, I think I picked for Wales another two years after that. So, just um, the tail of your like, career, isn't it? It is unbelievable. But, you know, there's, there's again, you go back to look who was available. You didn't have an out and out seven involved in that environment. Tips and Warby uh, mm. were both injured, and um, you know other boys then come through and and make their mark then as well. So, you know, it's it's just the way things go. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for every opportunity I've been given. Yeah, if you look at the back row that South Africa had that day, Francois Lowe, Willem Albert at seven, and, and Dwayne Vermeulen, and then you had the added thing of having Schalberger come off the bench. Yeah, that must have been some ride for 80 minutes. Yeah, you know, just big men mm. and bigger men come off the bench, basically. So, yeah, and you know, I played when we when we played the first test, I you know, Schalberger was. Probably my inspiration growing up. He's my, mm. uh, you know, him and Jer- Jerry Collins. You know, I think Schalberger was an absolute animal when he was playing when he was a youngster. And, mm. um, you know, to be able to swap jerseys with him after that after that first test, you know, is uh, I've got his jersey in the house somewhere. Mm. You know, it's a real honour to have his someone you looked up to and kind of idolised when you were a kid have his jersey in the house. Basically, that's amazing. Is it? Did you have any more um, jerseys from other players that you've come up against? Um, uh, I've got the Argentinian second row who plays with Gloucester. I can't remember his surname. Yeah. Um, I've got George Smith's uh, Barbar's jersey. I swapped with him. Oh, that's um, amazing. I went to swap with um, Lobby. Uh, yeah. It, when we played Argentina in 2012, but it was his 50th cap and he wanted to keep his jersey. Oh, so I got stuck with that one. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I've actually got a, it's not, it's a non rugby jersey. I've got Geraint Thomas's Tour de France uh, jersey. Oh, uh, I ended up. It was an auction, and I ended up picking up. So <laughs> I, that. I was going to say some of your rugby jerseys would be worth a bit of food bob in the next few years, wouldn't they? Um, so yeah, I got I got that, and um, yeah, I just I to be fair, I haven't swapped many. I've given a lot of my my Welsh jerseys to my parents, my brothers, mm. um, family members, really. So mm. you know, I've, I've only really swapped a handful of them. Mm. And, and we mentioned earlier, you know, you've gone on the tour of. Argentina in 2018, you know, what was it? A few years after the cap before. Um, and it seemed that tour was, was almost like a catalyst for for Wales were going well, Wales were going to achieve over the next 12 months, because obviously I think that was the start of the big run that they went on. You know, I think you beat South Africa and America, then toured Argentina, yeah. won all four uh, autumn internationals, won the Grand Slam, and obviously took that into the World Cup. Um, d- did you feel something special was happening within that camp? Because it looked like there was a lot of good young talent going on that tour, but it just looked like everybody was enjoying their rugby. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. It was they, they, there was a lot of confidence coming out of 2018. In mm. that, in, well, well, leading into 2018 summer tour, you know, and I wasn't initially selected. You know, I was, mm. uh, I was gearing up for time on a beach, and I booked a holiday to go to Lanzarote, and then. 
all of a sudden, I think the Scarlets played uh, Leinster or something like that, and someone got injured, and I had a phone call that afternoon, and um, yeah. and they said, uh, you know, you're going to be coming on tour, and we'll have someone pick you up from the house, we we'll pick a kit up from the Vale, and we'll meet you in um, in Heathrow, but they they couldn't get me on the same flight, so I flew the next, I flew that evening then, and I, I joined up with them the following day. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, they'd taken, they'd left, purposely left a load of senior boys at home and um, and they just took a load of youngsters and said, look, we're going to back you and we're going to, we're going to give you a crack and we want to see what you're all about. And, you know, to go over there uh, against South Africa, who were in, a, in decent shape at the time, and then to play Argentina t- twice, fully loaded pretty much, um, mm. and turn them over. Um you know, it put the it put the put the squad in a really good position moving into that that following year. Then mm. and they just went on a on a, a real good run then, and obviously led them into the into the twenty nineteen World Cup. Yeah, and obviously that was only three years ago, and you were only thirty at at that point. What was your thought process at that time? Because you know, in your mind, you've just been called up as a, as a late selection, and you know, you could see a load of the young players that might may be ahead of you in this players being left at home. What what was your thought thought process? On that tour, was you was you just trying to soak it all think, up and just enjoy it? Yeah, I think you got to enjoy it every time you go on on a on a tour and or you're involved in the, in the environment. And mm. you know, I, every I think because I only get cut one cap every two years, <laughs> I kind of see it as a new cap, <laughs> first cap every time. So you know, I just didn't enjoy being in that environment. And you know, I didn't I didn't take it too seriously. You know, I got involved mm. and everything, and you know, um, you know, I just enjoyed it. And I think you know, I was rewarded with two uh, opportunities off the bench then and mm. you know uh, and they both went well again so but you know I kind of knew uh, you know where I kind of stood in the environment you know those mm. boys young boys there who were going to be given an opportunity and I, I guess I was probably there just more more for my experience more than yeah. anything and you know to help some of these younger players along and you know it's it's, it's a good position to be in I think when you're a little bit older you know um, you're never going to say no to winning winning going on a tour or being involved in, in that environment Mm. I, I believe there was a there was a special moment in one of the tests with, you know, I, th- I think I saw the picture between you, Gareth Davis, and and Scott Williams, all of you being on the field at the same time. And and the, the special part about it is you're all from the same village. You know how amazing was that? Yeah, I th- it didn't it didn't um, it didn't click until after the game, and you know when we were all celebrating, and I was like, oh, fair play! It's the first time you know we all of us had gone on to play for Wales, but never been on the pitch together at yeah. any one moment. So, you know, and it was just a spur of the moment thing. I grabbed the three of them, grabbed the other two of them and three of us had a picture together. And, you know, <laughs> it, was a, it was quite a proud moment, to be honest, and especially for everyone from the Gus Lemon because, you know, it's the first time and only time I, I think it's happened. Mm. And, and sandwiched in between those two tours was the tour to New Zealand. Now, I think you only played in in the game against the Chiefs, which, you know, we, we'll try and forget about as, <laughs> as quickly as quickly as possible. What, what was it like playing in that game? Um, because I couldn't believe it. I, I was, at the time, I was working as um, a post, post boy for the Welsh Government, and I was trying to watch it on my phone. And I'm, everybody would sort of come through to my post room and say, what's the score now? I was, like, oh, I was 40 now. <laughs> it's, it's like, I just couldn't believe it. What was it like for you as players? We played uh, we played England before we went, and we were in a pretty yeah. we'd lost, but we were in a pretty good place. And then you know we went out that on that trip trip to New Zealand, and the boys first were test was all right, wasn't it? Test. You know the boys went well on that first test, and then and there was a couple of niggles, and boys who who were meant to play in that Tuesday or Wednesday night game weren't weren't uh, ended up pulling up through injury and stuff like that. So um, a couple of starters had to had to step in, like Toby and and Warby mm. and. Um, we just got run off the park. The, the 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 pace of the game they played at that, and I think yeah. that come through in the in the in the in the two tests after that with New Zealand as well. Mm. You know, those three three tour tests can be quite brutal at times, especially mm. if you're on the receiving end of a good hiding as well. You know, and you know you're doing it at the end of your season, and it's the beginning of their season, or mm. just after they've started. So, you know, they're pretty fresh. Um, but look, there's you know that tour in 2016, the tour in 2012 to Australia. Um, you know, I can't fault any of the tours I've been on really. You know, mm. I've been lucky enough to go to all four uh, countries, and um, 
and enjoy every moment of them, really. Yeah. And it's amazing. Yeah. That, is that one in New Zealand was I ended up coming home injured. So, yeah. Really, Again. Um, yeah. <laughs> didn't, didn't get a chance to, you know, after well, I had a bit of a bulging disc in my neck and ended up coming home early from it. So, you know, it was just, um, you know, timing again. Yeah. Uh, and I spoke to Elliot D a few months back and, you know, I was going through his career, you know, even though he's had a short career and he's still got plenty of, of games still to go. But we were talking about all the places that he'd been to and I couldn't believe it. And it's the same for you. You know, you've gone to Argentina, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, you know, made your debut up in Scotland, played at Twickenham. You know, these are just so many amazing, you know, memories that you've been able to make despite only, I keep saying only 10 caps. 10 caps is good. So, but it's still to be able to do I'll, that is quite it, amazing. Though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've had, you must have had some amazing experiences. Um, oh, yeah. There, you know, when you, you go you go into these places with, with the guys, uh, with your mates, and, you know, their experiences mm. you, you're never f- going to forget, really. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, things things you'll remember forever, basically. And, uh, mm. you know, uh, I think when you can when you can get victories as well it just makes it all all the more sweeter and, and mm. better basically yeah well i have a sneaky feeling that you you may be picked for for the next upcoming games as well was is there another two year gap now in between <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah there's been a lot of talk it has been a lot of talk of you being picked in the, the the games against canada and the two games against argentina again um is there, I would say, chance we may be able to see you in six weeks' time? Have you had any contact with Wayne Pivak? No, no contact. Um, you know, I all I can do is is keep my head down, keep working mm. hard, and that's always been my um, my motto, really. And you know, if if your form is good enough, it'll mm. you know higher honours will dictate it'll um, will come to you. But you know, my my main priority is 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 playing well week in week out for the Blues and. And if anything comes with it, it's a, it's a bonus. You mm. might be captain as well. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I'll, I'll have to get you back on then. I don't think you want to know me after you become captain. You might be too big for the podcast. <laughs> uh, but uh, I know we spent, we, 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 <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time talking about the past, uh, Josh. But let's quickly look to the future now. Um, have you got many more aims left on your rugby bucket list? Maybe playing abroad? Maybe playing in America, in LA? Um, well, I'm contracted to the Blues for another three years after this year. Um, oh, plenty of time. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, plenty of time left. Uh, I think, you know, going back to when uh, we won that Challenge Cup, um, it was a, that was a massive um, moment in my mm. career. And it's something I'd love to do again, just winning, mm. winning a trophy. And especially with a group of boys that are the Blues now, you know, and I think all of us, after experiencing that, we want to strive to do that again. I think if you asked any of the players, um, that 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 semi final against Pau at home, and mm-hmm. then the game against Gloucester uh, out in Bilbao, you know, massive massive occasions, and things like you want to be playing in those kind of games and those big in, in those big games. Um, so yeah, that's that's something else that I'd love love to achieve. You know, maybe a couple more more caps. Um, as for the Playing abroad, um, I'm not too sure. Obviously, you've got a young family and they're quite mm. settled now, but you never say never. Mm. I think Nick Williams was the one that told me that that weekend in Bilbao was one of the best weekends he's ever had. Is that true? Was there a few drunken messes that that, that weekend? Well, I think the, the three weeks leading up to that game, so we played we played uh, we played Power Home, beat them. Um, we had a massive bend after that one. <laughs> in the club, <laughs> uh, the following week, uh, they changed 13 players, and it was only me and Gareth Axcombe who started the following week against the Ospreys in the Judgment Day. Um, <laughs> and then we, we, the following week was the Bilbao final, and yeah. um, you know, we went, we went to Bilbao, we were full of confidence. Um, the way the game has been going, even though we lost that game against uh, the Ospreys, it was like 29 28 or something like that, yeah, real, real close. And to make 13 changes and to give a load of boys an opportunity, you know, mm. it kind of, there was a real good buzz. It actually felt like, you know, the team the Ospreys put out, we felt like we won the game. Yeah. Um, and then we had a real good build up to that, that final in, um, in Bilbao. And after the game, there was a massive reception back at the hotel where we were staying. Um, 
and then the, fo- the the following couple of days were just real messy. The Saturday night, <laughs> we were in an Irish bar in Bilbao, uh, absolutely steaming. Um, watched the Leinster game, um, travelled back, ended up going out in Cardiff on the Sunday. Yeah. Um, and then ended up on a barbecue, a barbecue and a, and a few vodkas on the, mon- on the Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> what a weekend. That's so, brilliant. Uh, I was like, I, was, I think I was putting something up like day four is better than day one. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice for you just to get to the final so you can do that again. That sounds like an amazing oh, I, weekend. I think you've got to celebrate those moments, you know. Mm. Um, and every, you know, I've done a few jersey presentations to, like, you know, I remember when Newcastle Emin got to the final of the plate in the stadium. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've done a couple of presentations to junior clubs who were in finals. And I've said, look, you've got to, you've got to cherish these moments because they mm. don't come around that often. Um, and you've got to enjoy the moment. You've got mm. to, you've got, and I, th- that's definitely what we did as a as a group of blues boys. Mm. And, and the moment. Uh, exactly. Uh, and I think you mentioned earlier that earlier on in your career, you you coached the likes of Kieran Hardy, Jam and Sebastian, uh, Will Boyd. I think at the the Scarlet's age grade level. Um, so is that something you're still very passionate about and want to get into when once you finally retire in ten years' time? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I keep telling the boys I'm going to play till I'm forty. So. You know. <laughs> It's all in the mind. More Welsh caps. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, coaching's definitely something I want to get involved in. You know, um, I've been doing it now for about eight, nine years. Um, mm. You know, I was maybe even longer, 10 years. You know, I was coaching mm. Scars 18s the last couple of years I was there and then came to the Blues 18s and obviously some of those boys now transitioned into the senior squad. Mm. Um, and then I've co- coached my, my home club, Newcastle Emden, for a couple of seasons. And I'm going to transition into coaching with the Premiership next season with Kamal and Quinn. So, mm. um, you know, it's definitely something that I want to go into after, after, afterwards. Um, you know, I'm doing my level four this year with quite a few boys who are familiar to the professional game. People like Lewis Evans and Hugo Staffson, mm. uh, Breezy, um, Craig Everett, uh, TRT, um, Reese Thomas. You know, yeah. and these guys are all. Some of them, a lot of them, are coaching already. A lot, some mm-hmm. of them come to the end of their careers, but you know, I the way I see it is I try and get as much experience now while I'm still playing and getting that balance right. That you know, it's going to be easier to transition into a coaching role when when that time comes. Mm, yeah, time I, to yeah exactly. <laughs> um, finally, Josh, before you go, is it okay if we finish with a quick fire round? Yeah, crack on. Right, I, I say it's quick fire, but every guest of our on has took at least 10 minutes to answer all of them, but there's only like eight questions. But they are quite difficult. So, uh, so here we go then. Uh, firstly, who's the best player you've played with? Regan King. Uh, <laughs> be- the, be- the best player you've come up against? Uh, it's pretty tough because you know I played against Tips, who's a who's was a who's a world class player. Yeah. You know, Don Davis, world class player. But then you know, instantly the first person to come to my mind was someone like Jerry Collins or or yeah. uh, Shot Berger. You know, because what they've achieved in the game, um, you know, someone like Owen Farrell. You know, so there's too many. Yeah. There's too many things. Brian yeah. Driscoll. You know, I've had quite a long career, so there's quite a few people. You know, <laughs> uh, Phil Bennett. You know, Henry, Henry, <laughs> 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 like, like Henry, Henry Tuolangi when he was at Pepinon, and the guy oh was just a monster. So, yeah. You know, uh, there's so many players that you know you could name. Mm. Um, you know, it's 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 pretty difficult one. Yeah, and it's crazy with it's it's crazy with Justin Tipperick as well because I think people always underestimate him for some reason. Whenever you know you've looked at the last three tours that he, well the last two tours and this one especially with the Lions, you look at everyone's selections. He's never in the test side in anybody's predicted test side. But Jerome Kino said he's he's up there in the top three flankers that he's ever come up against, and the same with Owen Farrell as well. I think when I had Sean Edwards on, I said who's the best player you've come up against as a coach? He said Owen Farrell. Which is, you know, is, yeah. is really surprising for some people, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And you know, Tips is like the silent assassin. You know, he yeah. can go about his work. He just doesn't moan, and you know, he's probably one of the best players I've played with and against. So, yeah. you know, he's he's quality. Oldest scrum cap in rugby, in it is either is or Jonathan Davis is, isn't it? We're in the same scrum cap for about twenty yeah. years. Uh, but yeah. anyway, uh, best friend in rugby. I'm quite close with Josh Navidi, actually. You know, yeah. when, when I first moved to the Blues, um, we hear, you know, we got on real well. Um, roomies when we go away to on away trips, you know, mm. I get on really well with Nabs or or 
Ken, Ken Owens. Yeah. You know, he only lives two minutes from the house, so I'd probably say those two, actually. I can't, Ken, I can't seems, pick yeah. <laughs> Ken seems like a great guy on a night out. I bet he's awesome. Yeah, you know, top top bloke. And, you know, our, our kids go to the same school, so we still see each other quite regular. Mm. And, uh, you know, what a guy on, on and off the field. So, you know, I, you know, he's a real top, top, top fella. Mm. And, and this may be yeah. another... another... The, bus. <laughs> the sheriff, what a nickname. Yeah. Uh, this might be another odd one. Your favourite coach? To be fair, I think, uh, you know, I've got a couple, only because of the different ways they've coached. Um, I've got to say Simon used to be because he was a player and he mm. transitioned into coaching and, and you know, he didn't, he didn't, take second best basically mm. and um, you know the, he never asked anyone to do anything he never did himself so you know that and you know he just worked incredibly hard um, and then you know Danny was a Danny Wilson was a pretty good coach in terms of his tactical technical technical knowledge and the way mm. he drove his he drove things in, in training and standards um, but I, I guess one of the biggest who had an influence on me is John Muggleton when he came to the Scarlets mm. um, and the amount of time he spent again with the youngsters um you know, and again on the amount of skills you skills work you did. So you know, there's there's just a couple there I've, I've named. Mm. And in terms of your own coaching, do you, do you take some of the best parts of each coach that you've played under? Yeah, I think you always as a, as a player you're always learning, uh, and even as a coach you're always trying to pick up things that other coaches are doing. Mm. And it's just you know maybe the way they present themselves in, in the front of a meeting or mm. the way they get their message across. You know, Sean Edwards was very much bang bang bang. The gap was quite. <laughs> You know, reserved, and you know, he'd just stare at you, and you'd be like, uh, "Have I done something wrong?" Or <laughs> I know that's not an easy feeling, but you know, if you didn't go out and perform, you know, you'd be in that, you'd be in a position where, like, "Fuck, have I done enough?" Or you yeah. know, you didn't want to let him down, basically. And then you know, you've got um, again going back to other coaches, how technical and tactical they are, and you're always picking up little, little, and how detailed they are in terms of what they're delivering. So you're always trying mm. to pick up something some little tips from each of the coaches you work with. Yeah. Uh, best match you've been involved in? Yeah, probably that POW semi-final. I enjoyed mm. that more than the final, to be honest. Even though the final really? was an awesome, awesome atmosphere and, you know, on the big occasion and we won, we come back from 40, set, well, 14 points down or whatever it was, 17 feet yeah. down to win it. Uh, I actually enjoyed the, you know, the build-up to that semi-final at home against POW. Star-studded POW at the time as well, full of yeah. internationals. And we was Conrad the Smith there at the time? Conrad Smith, um, you know, they had some absolute massive prop. I don't know who he was. <laughs> uh, the Armitage, uh, one of the Armitage brothers was there. You know, yeah. they, they had a real good team. And, um, you know, we had a load of youngsters playing and we went out and chucked the ball about and came out on top. So, you know, I just, I enjoyed, I, you know, full arms park. You can't beat it really. Yeah. Um, and that game probably... Uh, I remember forever, you know. I, yeah, it's not. It's pretty close to the final, but I, I enjoyed the semi final more. Yeah. Um, next question: Worst drinker you've played with? Worst drinker, Alice Summerhill, without doubt. I think. I think. Pours a, pours a pint of Guinness over his head rather than drinking <laughs> it. So, <laughs> without doubt, he's one of the worst. Typical party boy. <laughs> Dan Fish is pretty bad as well, but he just he keeps going and going and going until he's spewing his guts up <laughs> but Alice Summerhill I've never seen anything like it pub golf kind of Guinness on the head nah pours it over his head <laughs> uh, big, big, biggest troublemaker on or off the field oh there's a few wind ups Sanjay's a bit of a wind up <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah I've, I've seen Sanjay on the night though I've seen him on the field as well he, he, he's just full metal all the time isn't he yeah. <laughs> he's brilliant <laughs> he can't I love that that's the way he is, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and finally, Josh, if you weren't a rugby player, what would have been your dream job? The time there was a time when I was working in a kitchen. I wouldn't. Want, I wanted to be a chef. Um, <laughs> I yeah, think I that's everyone. Food. Everybody's wanted to be a chef, haven't they? Yeah, just too hard. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, the hours are terrible, so you want fans to be that. Um, something different, like uh, you know, an easy, an easy job where you've got good brains, but I haven't got that. So it's like. Structure engineer or quantity surveyor or something, yeah. <laughs> something, what, something different. So, rock star, yeah, rock star, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Especially those highlights. I'm going to say something else then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. The star on the end. <laughs> um, but, well, Josh, weird enough, buddy. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on today, mate. This has been really enjoyable. I had a good laugh. Um, all the best for the future with the Blues, and hopefully, fingers crossed, you get picked for that, um, those three matches in the summer, uh, and hopefully, Wayne Piver can uh, give you a call over the next few weeks. Cheers, mate. Appreciate that. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Bye-bye. Cheers, mate.